Miss Housekeeping announcements for four minute attractions. So please do come in and find a seat and make yourselves at home. And I wanted to say a very warm welcome on behalf of everyone here on site to the final day of the OER conference. So give yourselves a very warm round of applause. I know that some of us had a lot of fun last night. Some of us were outside shooting the horns in their pajamas and <laughs> waiting for firemen to rescue them. It was the fire, all was safe, but now we all know what pajamas look like. <laughs> Something I wasn't expecting, but um, I think there's limited evidence on social media. <laughs> um, I want to thank everybody involved, particularly the team here at UHI, the Tyler's colleagues who are working in all the rooms again today and who are presenting sessions as well. Um, it's been absolutely fantastic to be here. And also, another big welcome and thank you to our GoGN delegates. Give yourselves a little shout out here. <laughs> And a very warm welcome also to everyone joining us online, thanks to our platform partners, Cultura. And if you'd like to see more of the Reclaim Crew in action, I believe there is a fun session today, um, two actually, where you can see Lauren and Jim in action, and they may be singing, who knows? <laughs> so I'm looking forward to that already. Um, it's been fantastic to see so many of you share your impressions of OER on Mastodon and on other sites that we won't be mentioning here. hashtag. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to give a surprise shout out to our photographer down here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sometimes an official OER photographer, but there will be official photographs flooding across your networks later on today. And a big thank you for turning that around so quickly to us. Um, it's been absolutely fabulous to capture what OER is like up close and personal this year. Now, the moment you've all been waiting for, there's a housekeeping announcement. <laughs> yesterday, the art studio has become room 209. For those of you who have privilege, you had to room 211 where you can leave your luggage. It is leaving at your own risk, but it's only us in the building, so hopefully, if you leave laptops or other valuables, just please do use that to bring your uh, suitcase somewhere. And unfortunately, um, one of our number, Melissa Heiter, is unwell and we had to cancel her session. But I'm very glad to have Stuart Nickel with her, her colleague. So if you'd like to learn more about the work, I'm sure Stuart will be able to do and help you with that. <laughs> so with that, housekeeping announcements are finished. You are in for a wonderful day here at the OER conference. And now please put your hands together for Martin Weller, our coach here for this morning. <laughs> Fun. Had a good night. I think I had some nightmares about that spider cat thing. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, when the keynote was just great, they were really great. Yeah. So just not on another note. On last week's Tuesday, I think when people say this person needs no instruction, that's usually a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, it's not so true. <laughs> I've known Dave for 15, 20 years now. I think uh, we met through the early edgy blogger sphere and also general group. <laughs> so uh, yeah, then I've been warning to you don't, don't do blog speak to <laughs> to, to, to many things. So, um, yeah, so I'm going to let Dave come up and introduce himself. And, uh, and, 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 yeah. <laughs> Good to see you all. Thanks for coming. This is a remarkable attendance for a second day in the morning. I appreciate you all. I appreciate your dedications. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Um, so in 2019, I just finished, I just stopped working as the Manager of a medical school in Canada. Uh, speaking of things you shouldn't try, kids, don't do that. <laughs> and I had some time off, and I thought I was going to try to pull together the last uh, 15, how long we say, 15 or 20 years of blogging into some kind of book thing. I had this idea that there's this uncertainty layer happening beneath our culture that I can speak to 
and I was writing, and March 2020 came along, and then everybody knew that already. I had to go back and start again. But this is the title of that book, and I want to talk through some of the pieces that I've come to inside of that, and some of the some of the, the struggles that I've had with trying to talk about abundance, trying to talk about what it means to us, and trying to talk about what it means in the context of order. So uh, this is me. Well, actually, it's not me. It's from my hometown, but I am from Canada. <laughs> it is. Uh, it's been snowing path here. I live in Vancouver. I work at the University of Windsor. And I'm a learning specialist. I think it's digital <laughs> strategy and special projects. I school of higher ed dilettante. Um, I've done communications, I've done student orientation, and I've done all kinds of different things inside of higher ed. And the thing that holds it together is my interest in what kind of the internet means to our learning. So we're going to talk a little bit about learning and what it means and how it relates to technology and how our technologies have influenced that over the years. We're going to talk about abundance and what I think that means. And then we'll talk a little bit about how we can learn. For a bunch. What we're not going to do today is stay quiet. Feel free to shout out. Uh, <laughs> some of you, I might as well say that too because you do anyway, then it sounds like it's listening to me. <laughs> um, we're going to allow, we're not going to allow for counting because that's capitalism. You learned that yesterday. Okay. Uh, and we're not going to throw things. We may break that rule here in a minute, but you'll see how that's going to go down. <laughs> so I would argue that to some degree at least, Learning is a reflection of our information landscape, what's available to us, what we have, and what we need to get done. Right? So if we fly back 3,800 years, 38 and a bit, uh, this is a tablet from a school in Ejuba in Nippur, in Mesopotamia. Uh, this is one of the better ones. Uh, there's some really great ones for the students, and they're like, one mark here. So you take like a little wedge piece of stick, and you put it in the clay. At this time, this is close enough to the first written language we have. You can make some arguments about some places in Central America. Give or take, one of the first written languages we have. If you're in the Ajuba school, but you imagine that 3,800 years ago, you've got a clay tablet on your lap. You got a little stick. You need to know how to wedge out fish. It's not an opinion that you have. There's no creativity process in this. You need to make a recognizable fish so that when you put fish on the tablet, somebody else knows it's fish. And we have thousands, really, of extant uh, lexicon lists that you were basically meant to copy. Right? You had to memorize those words and write them out to the point that they were legible. Totally makes sense that that's a teaching approach in this context. That's level one inside the Eduba. Level two in the Eduba was the, the memorization of, depending on how you talk about it, 12 or 14 stories. One of those stories we have heard about is the Gilgamesh, and you had to actually write it out, right? So two layers of memorization. One of them is, can I get the words right? And the other one is, can I memorize the stories? And in that information landscape, totally makes sense, right? We've got to do that memorization. We take our time machine forward. Don't make me count that many years. That's too early in the morning, right? This is from an amazing extant um, advertisement that was up in Paris trying to lure people to the University of Toulouse where you are allowed to and again the word here is here the books of Aristotle which were forbidden at Paris the books of Aristotle that were forbidden were physics because it talked about the beginning of the world in a way that God did not approve of <laughs> now information infrastructure at this time you were not putting your grimy little hands on that book because we're talking about the death of like 200 sheep to make one single book or sheep, right? And I mean, so there were some places they would let you touch the books, but mostly you couldn't. Mostly you were in a catechetical model. Does that word bring familiar for anybody? Catechetical. If you have any... Um, Christian upbringing inside of schools, you'll have heard the catechism is the word. Catechetical is call and repeat. So I call it out, you call it out, I call it out, you call it out, because that's the only way that you're taking Aristotle out of that classroom. You ain't get the book. You can write little bits of it, but what you're trying to do is memorize it. Because again, the technology infrastructure we had at the time 
this damn sheet. <laughs> so we fly forward again. This is after the printing press. It's a couple hundred years after the printing press. Pestalozzi, my educational hero for Pestalozzi. Anybody, any Pestalozzi fans in the room? There must be one of you. One. <laughs> Pestalozzi, oh, that poor dude. He had so many fantastic ideas of how to build an education school. He'd build a school that would fall down and take it to the swamp. He'd build a school that would fall down and take it to the swamp. And then he had this idea that he wanted to teach the entire country of Switzerland how to read and how to do basic writing and arithmetic. And so he had this, you would take a book, and you would cut it down to little pieces. You might call it a, a textbook. And anybody, uninstructed schoolmaster, or in this case, as the book that he wrote, Gertrude, could teach her children without understanding the content of the book. She could just flip one page at a time, and go through that process, and be able to teach her kids without understanding the content. Much like a lot of our university classrooms. <laughs> Um, only good when an uninstructed schoolmaster can use it almost <coughs> And again, here we have a scarcity of teachers. We have scarcity of the uh, written text. We have a scarcity <laughs> of um, the books themselves. And we have a scarcity of the teachers involved in the process. So much of the history of education that we have is a question of scarcity. It used to be really, really hard. And this is actually, this is one of those books, I think it's, it's in that 200 uh, sheepskin phase. Really, really hard to come up, right? And a lot of our models are based on this. We left that behind. This is a shout out to my buddy Aras. This is from something we did seven or eight years ago. Some of you were probably there. But now we've gone from that point of scarcity, from that place of not having enough, to a place of having too much. Anytime you're going out looking for information, you now have piles and piles instead of not a whole lot in that process. Those classrooms themselves are built to solve the problem of scarcity. We have only so many books. Let's bring everyone to the school, right? We only have so many teachers. Let's bring them to the same place so we can put them together. And then all the things that come after that, the fact that a classroom is an hour long, the fact that all of those structures that we build we're all solutions for that problem of scarcity. And so many of the ways we run a classroom are the same. So there are ways in which a classroom um, is built because of that. I'm going to ask my helpers to come along. We're going to try to no, know it. No, you don't qualify. Look behind you. Got you. <laughs> Lovely so uh, one paper each, please. Sir. Welcome to class. We're having a test today. I hope that's ready. Study. One of the questions that we do. Okay. Okay, so as you receive your papers, has anybody here ever made a paper airplane before? Get out your prior knowledge. Now, I don't want any cheating. Don't look at the person next to you. All right, we have 11 minutes. And then the test is over. Which 
your paper airplane goes. You'll notice that some people are advantaged. We don't care about that. We're going to find a floor that matters. If you have failed, <laughs> if you have failed to make a paper airplane, you can use the backup method. <laughs> now, one, two, three, fire! <laughs> Yeah, and the rest of you fail. I apply my arbitrary accounting to you. So what do we have here? We have a classroom style activity. I have invented the challenge. I have given you a real you guys did really well. I gave you a really unreasonable challenge and an unreasonable timeline. And I get to measure success. It's how far the planes went. In this case. The two people who cheated <laughs> have managed to pass the test well done. It's not cheating, it's just all tangible. What? <laughs> all right. Yeah, now, that, now that I know it's you, now it goes All right, so I get to decide those things. In this classroom uh, style stuff, I'm sure cheating class are super interesting, 1984, onward. Okay. So, yeah, I understand that not all classrooms are like this. There are lots of fantastic educators out there. But at the end of the day, the end of the day, we have this assessment that's built into the vast majority of what we do. No matter how creative and wonderful your classroom is, the vast majority of us end up in Blue Microsoft's corporate model of counting the learnings that you've had. And no matter how creative you are, at some point, you end up stuck here somewhere. And I guess you can get around it a little, but broadly speaking, this is where we are. Okay. This uh, fantastic article. <laughs> Your flight is leaving. <laughs> you want to let me send up the <laughs> This fantastic article by Nathan Ensminger tracks the history of chess. Inside of education, I will not bore you today with my long rant about chess, but the point is, is that as soon as you have our corporate counting, we have a game, and that game is something you can win. Had 72 co-op students work for me during the pandemic, uh, some fantastic kids, but they're all students who had no interest in open education, like literally nothing. <laughs> right? So I had engineers, I had kinesiology students, I had computer science students, those had, like, there's a little overlap at least. Uh, business, right? And but their co-op terms all got canceled. Their co-op terms all got canceled because of the pandemic. So they came to work for me, right? But what it ended up being is I had this really cool relationship with students I've never met before. There are students that I was not grading in any way, paying them, but they didn't pay them, right? So we had all of these conversations around the game of school. It became the, the sort of theme. Of the, I think I had seven different groups for four months, over and over again, came back to the same thing. I don't go to school to learn, that's where I just play the game of school, right? If I want to learn this thing, I go home and do it. I don't get involved in that process because I understand that in a classroom, the only thing I'm really there for is to give the teacher what they want. At the end of the day, no matter how it gets matched up, no matter how creative that person is, no matter how interesting the class, at the end of the day, they're judging me. My job is to figure out what they want and find a way to give it to them. So our uh, Bonnie and I's kids, uh, I can't imagine, you can imagine, if, just given the tone you've heard so far, what my poor children must be like. <laughs> um, so you have two kids, uh, educational researchers, who go through the public school system, and we've had to sit them down and have this chat. <laughs> you were involved in a game. You could go find out if your teacher is somebody who actually wants to teach you in a creative way? If that's not true, figure out the game, figure out what they want, pass the game, don't get emotionally invested. Every once in a while, you find a great teacher, and that's fantastic. You can love that person. So don't let the rest of it touch your heart. So much of our system is like it. This is the, this is the I, I, you've heard me give this example before. I apologize if this one touched my heart. One of those 72 students, we were two weeks into the term. Him working for me. So again, not my student. And I asked him about something, and he goes, just stop. You know that look on someone's face when they finally realize something? And he goes, 
have to apologize to you. I'm like, nice to you. And he goes, I just, you've been asking for my opinion this whole time for two weeks, and I just assumed you were lying. Because no adult has ever asked me a question without already knowing the answer. Right? And for me, with those 72 students, with students I've spoken to since, with faculty from around the world I've spoken to since, this is what we end up to. This is what our system leads us to. Not only the belief that there's a right answer, but the belief that someone else knows that right answer, and the job of learning is to find the person who can tell me what that right answer is. Now, I don't have to map out the different ways in which our culture has gone down pear-shaped because of this, right? So people look to people who are very loud, very noisy. Just <laughs> 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 Give them answers to questions. Not nuance, not complexity, not the breadth of the question, but a very loud answer that they can take home and that allows them to feel like they got the answer, to feel like they've done the test right. This is how, not everybody, but this is how we've aligned the education system. But we had to. Information was really hard to come, right? It was really hard to access. Get it. The simple fact is that we moved on. And when we're in a time of abundance of information, again, I don't necessarily mean abundance in a good way. Right? We get abundance of everything. We don't just get the abundance of the things we want. We don't get just an abundance of... Seymour Papper talked about the knowledge machine. Right? It's a beautiful machine, and a little girl could go to the machine and ask, does a giraffe sleep lying down? And the knowledge machine would go, well, actually, it's a funny one, because it turns out that giraffes don't sleep both ways. So maybe we got a really good knowledge machine that figures that out. But that's not the knowledge machine we've got. The knowledge machine we've got will sell you a giraffe piggy bank. It will tell you about giraffes. It will probably show you some coaching about giraffes. It will show you all the things about giraffes and a whole bunch of lies about those poor giraffes at the same time. Right? So our knowledge machine has all the things. And all of that is inside of this abundance. But given that abundance, given the misinformation and disinformation and the good information that's all there, how do we go about finding that right answer? Right? So the claim that I would make is the move from information scarcity to information abundance fundamentally affects what and how we learn. Right? So we go from how can I find that one thing I need to do? How do we make sure we don't lose the knowledge of how to make a mold board plow? The most boring instrument. Anybody know what a mold board plow is? No mold, no, mold, no mold board plow exists. <laughs> it's a plow that turns the soil over, that in Northern Europe allowed them to plant more wheat and double the size of the towns, basically, and double the amount of crops you get. Fantastically important piece of thing. If you do a Google search now, it'll take you five seconds to figure out how to build one. But if they lost that piece of information, they were toast. Or not toast. <laughs> so, we have something that can help us with this abundance. No problem. <laughs> right? We can just go to ChatGPT, it answers questions, there are no, if you call that answering, it's trained on the internet, partially, partially on Reddit. Not necessarily why all my answers come, but it is generative. It's not like I'm even taking it from somebody else. It takes all of that information and puts it together. What could be better? And frankly, I can't imagine a government mid level bureaucrat right now who is not using it. Having been in that role as well, having somebody roll into your office and go, I want a report done in two hours, I'm going to do it because I need the report done. Right? So, this is how we're going to be handling abundance in an awful lot of hidden cases inside of our culture. It's terrifying. <laughs> um, we're auto-tuning. Right? So uh, in 1997, Shares, I believe, that's what it was called, was the first auto-tune song to make a kajillion dollars. Exactly a kajillion dollars. <laughs> but it takes all that sound and it smooths it all out so everything sounds the same. 
right? It takes all the nuance out of the process and makes it palatable, which is basically what our AI systems do now. Well, palatable. It makes it through our scarcity models of checking, so when people are sending them into peer review journals and it's making it through that process, but there's so many scary pieces underneath this. If you've not seen this, this is from OpenAI's actual research. This isn't even somebody else doing it. These are the biased word descriptions that went along inside of the, it's GPT-3, but these are the biased word descriptions. These are the words that slip into the creation of the text, right? So for all those people who are talking about AI in their classrooms right now, this has to be part of the conversation. Right? These things are slipping into the process. We've got a means of production problem here, too. Um, if you're not familiar with Tim and Gebru's work, I heartily advise it. Um, the Dare Institute, basically her Twitter account is fantastic, uh, following that time. But the means of production is problematic here, too. So this work does not get done in a vacuum. It does not get done in some kind of sanitized way. But if we don't have another option, this is so easy. It's so easy for most of the things we want. Um, I think there are other options out there. I don't know where this example came to my mind. Might have been sometime <laughs> yesterday <laughs> during a conversation. I don't know why, Tim Group. This one reminded me. Well, we can go out and create prefab solutions. The problem with this prefab teaching solution is that it has a lot of baked in assumptions as well, right? So ChatGPT bakes them in, well, I won't say randomly, because it's not really randomly, and I will not describe myself as a as understanding well enough to know, but it's, it's kind of in there because it's in the internet and because nobody cares. In this case, you have other things baked in. This is from Teachers Pay Teachers, which is strictly a K-12 system, but this is such a fun example. <laughs> When we're talking about entrepreneurs and social responsibility, this person's example was the great job that Mark Zuckerberg has done as a social responsibility person. And this is from 2015 when he said he was going to give away 99% of his wealth. <laughs> Look out that way. <laughs> but the point is, is that here again, when we create these secondary and tertiary items, right? and again, I'm not saying textbooks are a bad thing. There are lots of places where open textbooks make total sense. Please do not throw more hard things at <laughs> But the secondary and tertiary pieces we make have all this stuff baked in. All these things baked in. So we can try open education instead, maybe. But I think it was, who was it yesterday or two days ago, said we all know what we mean by open practice in this room, but by open education, I would argue we probably don't know. Um, what do we mean by that? So we want open access and open publishing, Widening participation, open education practice. This is great. If we're replacing $300 textbooks in physics classrooms, I don't care if that's a step in the process. I don't care. It's fantastic. Because the amount of money that kids are paying on textbooks, I mean, if it means that we are going to have textbooks, and again, I understand that we'll be publishing for the textbooks, but if it means we're having textbooks that are written by humans, because I don't think we're two or three years away from all textbooks not being written by humans. Right, with all of those biases we saw before baked in. But the open publishing part of this means that we have direct access to humans doing deep thinking work that we can bring to our classrooms. But I think that part of it is super important to this process. Widening participation is a, um, an expression for those of you who are from my side of the pond that we aren't as familiar with. Uh, so I will go ahead and explain it anyway for those of you who are as uneducated as I was. Um, this is something we should all be doing all the time. This is about making more room for more people, taking away different kinds of barriers and making our schools places that are open to everyone. And not just open as there's a door open and if you know how to get in, you can come in, but open in ways where we go out and help you get in the door. This is obviously something we should be doing. This part of open education should be as a constant. Open educational practice. Um, I was going to go ahead and talk about what I was doing in terms of this, but almost every definition I find is about, is directly connected to um, 
the Wiley, the Wiley definition of open educational practice, which is about using open educational resources. And again, the piece here that I'm interested in is high quality open educational resources. Because once we do this, we've already pre filtered the content coming into our classrooms. And that's the piece that I think is really important. Because that abundance that we were talking about earlier does not contain a filter. We can use ChatGPT as a filter, it's a shitty filter, but it is a filter. We can use things like Lumen Learning as a filter, not my favorite filter, but it's a filter. It allows you to get to, we can use really good high quality resources as a filter so that the content that comes into our classroom is already high quality, having no relationship to the regular human experience that anybody has when they try to learn anything. Right, so the thing that I find most important in all of this is how does somebody who takes three science classes in university as part of their English degree learn how to evaluate science? Right? How do they learn how to deal with the thing that they read on Facebook right, so that they make good decisions, so they become good voting citizens who can make good decisions? I don't even need them to make my decisions. But I don't need them to make the ones that are based on my values. I just need them to make decisions based on values. <laughs> Any values, frankly. So, uh, 2011, some guy, we need a pedagogy of abundance. I agree with you. At some level, we need to be thinking about this, and one of the intersections of this has to be about the abundance of content that we have. The abundance that every person who comes into our classroom, when they leave our classroom and forget everything we said, and go back and try to relearn it, that they have the skills they need to relearn that based on whatever they're confronted with. Right? Because it's not the thing they come out of our classroom, it's not the thing that was counted in our classroom that they take away, it's the skills that they pick up that allow them to succeed a successful citizen for our public. Have that abundant integration, have that abundant challenges. We have uncertainty at our fingertips, and in two kinds, right? There's uncertainty as in not currently known. <coughs> I can't figure out whether I should do this, but there's basically a right or wrong answer, mostly right, mostly wrong. We need to be able to solve this kind of uncertainty. The one that really interests me is the not fully known. We had a couple people yesterday talking about wicked problems, perfect example of that. Should I be using fossil fuels in my house? So many different questions that we have that don't have those clear answers, that will never have a clear answer. Because there's no right way of doing it. There's only the process that we go through. There's only the adaptations that we do. Each time we ask the question, the problem kind of shifts on us, right? Two solutions to this kind of problem. One, you continue to work through it and use the skills you learn. And the other one is, you find someone really noisy to tell you what to do, right? That second version is the way that we've created our education system. Someone has the right answer. My job is to find the person who has the right answer and listen to them. So this is one of my favorite examples to use. You get deal with uncertainty. You're in a classroom. You're pulling up random content. You get Facebook one. It's the process by which we evaluate the content. That I think it's a big help. So I ask you as a group, how's my man doing? <laughs> <laughs> I will say historically for that one dude that's sitting in the room going, he's doing great. <laughs> Maybe don't offer that opinion. <laughs> but I heard it I heard the lot. <laughs> what can we do to help him? What's the advice you have for him? Okay. <laughs> Move the loot. Maybe don't shove it in her face. Maybe the man the loot. What's that? Maybe the man the loot. Okay. No clear answer to this. There's no clear. We can tell. We know there's a problem, but it's the evaluation process, the decision involved with that process that matters. So I end up and I leave you with three recommendations for a pedagogy of abundance, it's part of it. They're the ones that I've come to in this process. 
So, and you're random. Three. And I like open education approach, whatever you call it, three pieces. The first one is we need to constantly, constantly demonstrate our humility. The, word, the expression, I don't know, has to be the first one that comes out of our mouths all the time in our classrooms. If we're taking up the random things that come across, and I do, I do this way all the time, go find an answer to this, post it up, we're going to talk about each of the ones you found. Right? The first thing we always have to come back to is, I don't know what that is, I've never seen that thing, I'm going to show you how I can learn more about it. Right? This has to be the starting place. The idea that you know already is the biggest problem in this whole process. You, the students too, and it has to come. The, the, the idea of expertise, a discussion we had two days ago, the idea of expertise has to start with this word, not I know everything and I walk into my classroom already knowing all the things. All right, so that's the first piece I write. The second one is to model maybe trust. Right? So I go to this place to read this person for this reason. And this person has become part of my community in this way, right? This kind of modeling is something that can break down the training of 12 years in our student town, at least 10,000 hours as it were, of learning that they've had before they've come into our classroom that teaches them that there is just a right answer and that's all you're looking to find, but rather that process of how we come about to know who we learn to trust, what we learn to trust, and why we do it. And the last piece is we need to show those values that we have, I think, that allow us to choose not just the right answer, but the answer for the reasons that we think are important to us, right? And model that choosing in a way that shows it up. So that humility, trust, and values don't count. We're not going to measure those things, but they matter. And I think that at the end of the day, we take that OER piece and bring it into our classrooms. We make that part of the way we come to know, right? We can share that new way of going about making knowledge that fits into the information infrastructure. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Share a quick story. Oh, oh. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I did not wrote an event organized by George Siemens. We went into this workshop, uh, was it a 19 workshop? Maybe? It was a workshop, workshop. Okay. We went into this two hour workshop, uh, some of the items, uh, designing movies. Dave and I sat down at the front, and then George stood up and said, Right, Dave's from this workshop. And that was the first day we heard about this. Yeah. <laughs> we walked out of the door and left. He <laughs> didn't even stay. And it did not have a title. No, 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 no. There was no title. No. Dave Corby is going to leave this workshop. He walked out the door. And to be fair, they got up and ran a two hour workshop. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm tempted to do the same approach with the people. Not tempted. up say, Dave's given the keynote. said, we should let people know when they let themselves go. So I did that. And I think you know, uh, it played off with a great uh, great thing that people did. So, uh, question. Comments? Sir, you'd like to throw it. Maybe I still need to think about it a little bit more, but I didn't quite catch the leap from abundance of information, values, humility, and trust, and open education. Sure. To me, there's a disconnect there. Maybe you can help me see that. Sure. Um, so, with so open education has a lot of frames, right? So if you look at open education as the open license part of open education, and the framing I'm talking about is on this. If you talk about open education as open to different content, open to the internet, open to whatever information comes in, open to the abundance of the internet, then you have a different series of skills you need to do to be able to filter. In a normal classroom, you come in having a normal classroom again. I know not all of your teaching is fair, but in a classroom, you come in having decided six months ago what the content is, everything is pre filtered, and everything is pre decided. So, none of that process of evaluation ends up being part of the conversation. And that fit the experience the vast majority of people would have had 35 years ago when they went about learning something outside their classroom. So, that represented 
what I think I'm doing a better job of this. It's representing the way that somebody would learn when they left their classroom. They would go to a library. They would go to a bookstore. And they would find content that was also prepackaged for them, and they would use the same product, same approach. Now, no one is going to the library. Almost no one is going to the library. Librarians are wonderful places. I love libraries. <laughs> Nobody is going for a library to answer their simple questions. So the skill set that you need when you come into the classroom is not that how do I use a pre-evaluated published textbook, it's how do I deal with random content that comes in, and that skill set that I think you need includes humility, <coughs> the application of values, and effective trust. Oh. <laughs> Can I go back and say that as part of the topic? <laughs> else? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so um, abundancy uh, leads to uncertainty. Yeah. And scarcity, sort of certainty. Certainty is the defensive mechanism we need to use for scarcity, right? Because you need to switch it up so that you can keep it. Keeping it in that random sense means the same thing Socrates. You know what? Oh, shut up. Exactly. <laughs> so I, so I, I was sort of thinking of Nietzsche and God is dead, and then there's, there's this void that needs filling, and we are in that stage of masculine, that, that yeah. kind, of, kind of void. And I was also thinking in that abundance, what what is kind of lost? And you sort of mentioned this agricultural example. Yeah. And um, the sort of language of flowers and nature and trees have kind of been lost in that kind of abundance, maybe. So your thoughts on those sort of names? Um, that's a wonderful comment. Uh, yeah, totally. I think I'm going to let you continue on that. So I'm going to make sure I respond to that. That's, I'm going to have to fix that. I don't know. Oh. Let me think about it. Sorry, yeah, I'm thinking about it. <laughs> Anybody else? Hi. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah. As a librarian, speak a defense of alternative. Um, but not a teaching librarian. Do you think there is a place for it? I mean, I, I know of librarians who do this, you know, helping people find their way in abundance. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we accepted that, that people don't come to the bookstore anymore. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, it's where where would you place the role of, of the teaching skills of librarians? Literally, yes. Yeah. yeah, no, I think the librarians who are making this adaptation, right? I know some of the people you're talking about, yeah. since I'm working in libraries. Um, it is. You know, librarian is about solving the information landscape that we're in, right? They're about navigating that information landscape. And absolutely, who better to develop those? That, again, I think it's it, obviously there are skills from scarcity that still apply. If there are new skills that need to come in, definitely. We, yeah, I think we, we need people who are specifically working. Thank you. So I. It seemed like when you're talking about knowledge scarcity at the beginning, it had to do with access to materials. Like, do you have a rock you can scribble on or a hundred lambs to make the book? And I'm, I'm thinking of some of the work of, of other colleagues, indigenous knowledge and understandings. When I bring this home, how can I make sure I'm capturing and understanding that not all knowledge was on sheepskin and rocks? A great point. You want to um, Socrates. In the Phaedrus okay. said that um, all this writing stuff was terrible because people were going to lose the, the, the wisdom that was involved in it. You were just going to be able to do it from recall and not because you actually knew it and understood it. You couldn't actually actually do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a, even in the Western tradition, certainly. I think when you look at indigenous people knowing, um, so in, my Canada, in my country, this has become a really big issue since. Um, the ninth oracles that we did. We have a whole terrible history to cover. Um, I have, um, I was fortunate enough to work with an elder last year working on indigenous ways of knowing ebook. Uh, and mm -hmm. it was a huge learning experience for me in terms of that. In terms of the ways in which story carries more than information, it carries knowledge, it carries wisdom, it carries experience, and the ways in which it changes by the different indigenous people that are carrying that story and also the ways in which 
the people I was working with, the different humility with which they approached it because of that. I think there's ways of learning inside of all of that, mm -hmm. that again are not just about information, but about the way you open. That humility piece is, is a big part of at least the vision of people that I was working with. Mm -hmm. I think that's the more we can get involved in that, the more that we can find ways to learn from that, the better the rest of it. It can be kind of a both and even back oh, then, absolutely. but we didn't capture okay. Totally, totally. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, it's great. Follow on from my uh, great colleagues. Would you? Have sympathy with the term information literacy, which is often used uh, to describe much of what we're sure. talking about, which I think of as a soft applied discipline information literacy. Yeah. And I think the good connection possibly is to know who we are through the channel of uh, the discussion of the people landscape mm -hmm. led on. Information literacy, data literacy, all those pieces are in for sure. Yeah, um, I mean, information literacy, data literacy, difference. And again, I'm not, I would not try to define either of those. Anybody who is working in this direction, I'm happy with them. Whoever it belongs to, I'm okay with that too. In terms of the definitions, I certainly wouldn't be qualified to say whether or not it fits inside. In well, so, well done. <laughs> <laughs> no sunny guy over you. No, no. <laughs> Go ahead. Comments and a question. <laughs> is it more of a comment than a question? <laughs> I appreciate your honesty. <laughs> that intersection, the first person who asked the question, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, but that intersection between abundance, mm -hmm. humility, trust, and values, and open mm -hmm. that space. Yep. I see a lot of work done by people in this room and people who are in human spirit and the work around critical and social justice approaches to open. That's where I see a lot of that work happening. You've been like so, humanizing learning work the last, last couple of years. Yeah, so the definition of open education practices that went on your slide, I think, is a slightly dated direction. What's the word? Please. Yeah, they not found not it not. in your context, but it's not the dominant one necessarily in Europe. Well, here's the thing. Probably needs the dominant one in Europe. I was trying to find the definition that I could use that actually had that out there. And is there is there one in York? Because I never I never thought to look. Yeah, the Europe, Europe, South Africa. I mean, I'll we'll talk. Because I'm more, no no I'm more than happy. But I went looking for it. and I'm like, oh, I can't call it. I can't find that. Because again, I'm not trying to adopt anybody else or or co-op anybody else's definition. And I'm more than happy to use different ones. But yeah, for sure. Yeah. But anyway, the, the point is not so much about the definition itself, but just that the evolving understanding, as I see it, of open educational practices is about. Letting go and, and decoupling from who we are it doesn't necessarily include who we are. Totally. It may include who we yeah. are, but it's about co creating knowledge. It's just what we're talking about. Oh. The question is the way you start the conversation about abundance is not necessarily where the conversations start when we start with OEP or, you know, or open. So I'm just wondering how receptive <laughs> are the people to start a conversation where you started it today. Because that seems to be something that everybody can look into rather than people saying, Again. So I think it could be generative to start the conversation in a different place. With abundance or with open? With abundance. Oh, yeah. The way you started yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's exactly why. I, so I learned the term open education from Alec Kuros. Uh, and I've used it for years. Again, it ended up being one of those words. We explored this in the GoGN session. One of those words that I find lacks explanatory power, right? Because it ends up being so conflicted. Well, so many different ideas. The word that I, I, I discovered, lack of explanatory power from two days ago, was expert. Um, because people have so many different ideas of it that it doesn't get to where you need to get really quickly. Whereas this abundance argument has been a really easy one. It's been a pathway for me to get into this conversation. Because for my, um, so I teach, right, and I just finished teaching free service students. So that in Canada, that's students who will be K-12 teachers. There's so much deep programming that needs to happen. Right, but they know what abundance is. Right, they have an intrinsic yeah, sense of it. Human. Plus, they don't have a pre-existing definition for it. So I can drop in there, set up that conversation without fighting back against all their preconceptions about what that is. I ran the open one today because of the audience, but mostly I don't use it anymore. I may say it, I make reference to it, I mean it in my head, but I've stopped using it because I end up in arguments with people. I don't care about the definitions. Right? I'm an uncertainty guy. Like, okay, really, I don't care. About they're, to me, they're just exercises in power. Right? I get to control the definition. 
I'm trying to get to the point. So yeah, I have that more excuse. That's exactly why I'm using <coughs> There's a bunch of people who are lined up. I'm gonna go back there and you know. Thank you, first of all, and thank you for the publication did so. <laughs> the wonderful <laughs> analogy about uh, auto tuning. It's so oh, yeah. good. It's, it's really great. Yeah. Like, because uh, I think we're always trying to maximize or minimize. We're maximization and minimization machines. We're trying to like really, you know, yeah. maximize or minimize something. Um, so that's it's brilliant because it, we get so focused on something. Uh, but the, the the provocation, yeah, yeah. is. I believe in life after love is an epic song. I think it's something amazing with it. Look, I, I am not going to stand here and criticize Shane. No way. I do not deserve that. I am not worthy of that conversation. So we'll take it. Thank you very much. That's the presentation. Um, I think, um, like a uh, bit down the front, I'm sort of I think I'm following all of the steps necessarily of your argument, but I appreciate there's a book length version which probably, you know, let's check it out. Blood. <laughs> <laughs> so, so my question is really about, about your kind of recommendations, uh, demonstrate the ability, model the way the trust, show how we choose uh, with our values, um, and just sort of the language around that, because you've, you've sort of given this kind of essentially a sort of a critique of pedagogical authority right, in some of this stuff. The right answer model and so on. Um, but then the way you frame your kind of recommendations almost repeats a sort of authority model. Demonstrate your humility to your students, to your learners. Model the way we trust to your learners. Show how we choose to your learners. And I don't know if that's a conscious thing or if it's just because you're speaking to the educators and it's inevitable that there is this sort of relationship there. But if it is inevitable, there's that kind of power relationship there. How does your critique of that authority sort of cohere with that? I have no problem with mentorship. I think it makes total sense. And I think the pedagogical models that support clear learning objectives, this sort of John Hattie, for those of you who are familiar, approach to education, I have no problem criticizing that and maintaining mentorship as a really important part of the process. I don't think that uh, there are a dozen people in this room who've been mentors to me. And have demonstrated the way that they work, and I'm happy for that mentorship. I don't think that's a conflict between those two things. I'm happy for both, for sure. Uh, yeah, I really find this very inspiring, and I uh, use all of these ideas in my own practice. So that's yeah, yeah. great. But I have a question that yeah. comes up comes up with this about. <laughs> uh, it's not my book, it's a book that uh, other people actually oh, okay. uh, communicate to me, you know, conveying that sense to you. Um, when I talk with friends who teach engineering or hard sciences, ah. when I when I talk about these things, they but yeah, yeah, you work in uh, humanities, languages, you know, all these things are quite, you know, you can start the journey from different places, and you, you know, having this uncertainty and this <laughs> is part of the learning objectives. So very well, but I have to train people, educate people about that. So that the plane, you know, the plane that we threw, that it doesn't crash, that it actually, yeah, it, uh, and, and it actually respects all the rules about the environment, etc., etc. So, how do you reconciliate all these uh, discourse and this ideology? Yeah, with people who have to teach in other types of subjects, but probably are not very well represented. We take architecture as an existence? Okay, but yeah. Think okay. about the building, not falling. Yeah. Okay. So I was at I was at TU Delft last year. Uh, we were at a conference, and um, there they're coming to grips with the idea that architecture um, architects in the future will no longer be using new materials inside of the Netherlands because they can't um, conscience using. They, they kept talking about cobalt running out in twenty thirty one. Apparently, this is a terrible thing that's happening to all of us. We're running out of cobalt. It's important for reasons I don't understand. But apparently, it's bad. So they're looking at not building new buildings, not using new materials, but being architects, right? And so now they're being struck with all of these other issues that are not true and false questions that involve all these <laughs> uncertain terms. That's becoming a part of the life that they're working. It's true of all professions. All these been true of all professions, right? So. Making the paper airplane, there are, turns out, a bunch of different ways to make a paper airplane. 
uh, and ways around making a paper airplane, but this is such a small part of the design process. Figuring out how to get your funding from the person who's going to help you design, your, like allow you to design your plane, is actually way more about the engineering process. And that is a subtle yeah. sort of, and that I think is the argument that they end up making. Sure, there are facts in the world. I'm not suggesting that there aren't. There are definitely processes that people need to do. I do not want my plane falling out of the sky. And frankly, I don't want the person on the assembly line who is putting the plane together to get all creative about where they're going to be. It's not that everything is like it. There are definitely things, and I think in every field there are things like that. Sadly, we still make people use citation, like APA citation, like the same kind of form and format sort of thing that's antiquated and terrible thing to do to a child. But we still do it. We have those in every field, I think. Um, are there more in engineering? Maybe. But when I had 35 engineering students work for me, you know what they couldn't do? Deal with any kind of uncertainty. Even if there was a right answer, they couldn't do it either. So I had so many great arguments for engineering problems. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, um, I was interested to hear you so in an age of abundant definitions, you turn to the easy one for students. And I wondered if you'd considered turning to feminist pedagogy theory as well. I, my journey in philosophy started there, feminist theory. That was the thing that opened my eyes the first time. I tried, certainly don't represent it because it's not my place to speak for it, but it's certainly been something that I try to incorporate in a lot of work. So what, what theories did you use? In this? No, in the journey. Oh, that was 30 years ago. Oh, okay. <laughs> in that case, uh, we should talk later. We've got sure. some great stuff totally. come out recently. That's great. Which references all the other stuff. Great. Thank you very much.